So dinosaurs and people existed together just a few thousand years ago, huh? All right, I heard that's what you learned last week. Can I get you to flip those lights on for me back there in the back? We're going to talk a lot more about dinosaurs. That's right. We're going to talk a little bit more about them. How many of you know what kind of dinosaur this is? Anybody know? A brachiosaurus. That is correct. That, a lot of people do call them a long neck, but yeah, that is, that's what he is. He is a brachiosaurus. In fact, Dr. Sparky's dinosaur is just a baby brachiosaurus just like that. Now, this brachiosaurus would wind up being bigger than this church. He's pretty, pretty huge. Yeah, he's, he's a gigantic a animal. Yes, you do see a giraffe because these animals were also alive at the same time. Now, obviously, this giraffe would only be about probably yay tall compared to this brachiosaurus. If we were doing him in real life size, he'd only be about this tall next to the brachiosaurus. He'd probably barely come up to right about here, let it go on his neck. Yeah. That just to let you know just about how big, maybe not even quite that, because a person... A person only comes up to about right here on him, if you can imagine that. But, so actually, this giraffe would probably be much smaller. Yes, and you see a hippo, and you see an elephant. We're going to talk about these. How many you know what this is? A triceratops. A triceratops. Very good. And everybody's favorite dinosaur is T-Rex. T-Rex. That's right. Why is he everybody's favorite? I guess it's because he's mean and nasty. Does anybody know what this dinosaur is? What? Leviathan. Leviathan is the name of this particular dinosaur. This is not one dinosaur that you see talked about a whole lot, but you are correct. It is a water dinosaur. Quite possibly, a dinosaur similar to this is where they got the whole idea for the Loch Ness Monster. Because they are serpent-like, as in a serpent, I mean snake-like. And uh, you usually see them as humps coming up out of the water. So that is, that is kind of some of the dinosaurs that you would see that we're going to talk about today. Now, how many remember today's power verse? Anybody know what today's power verse is? It's probably in my Bible. I don't Who is the power verse about today? Job. Job. Job, that's right. And God was talking to Job, and he talked to him about a particular animal. What animal was it he was talking to him about? Dinosaur. Leviathan, that's correct. Leviathan is the particular dinosaur that they were referring to today in your power verse. Leviathan, now this is, this is a artist's idea of what Leviathan might look like based upon the description in the Bible and based upon actual fossil records that they have found. Now, I wanted to talk to you today about these dinosaurs. I think Brother Greg filled you in last week about some cool stuff, but how many of you, this is your first time here today? Wait, let me if this is your first time here. All right, well, I'm going to backpedal, and I'm going to talk to you about some other really cool stuff. Last week, Brother Greg read to you out of the Bible a passage about this critter right here in the book of Job, chapter 40, I believe it is, that God is describing to Job this guy right here. Now, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Everybody say, the oldest. the oldest. It is the oldest book in the Bible. It is not the first book, but it is the oldest. It is the oldest written book. It was written around the time of Moses, probably a little prior to Moses' time. And when Job was being tested and tried, Job came through it beautifully, by the way, because no matter what happened to Job, God took care of him, and he knew that God would take care of him, and he did. Well, after this was all over, in the 40th chapter of the book of Job, God says to him, he said, have you considered Bohemoth? Take a good look at Bohemoth. And he starts describing to him, his, his ribs are like iron bars, and his tail is like a cedar tree. Now, there are some modern scholars, in fact, there are some Bible scholars, who are even Pentecostal in our AG that said that that guy is talking about, in the book of Job, not a brachiosaurus. He's talking about a hippopotamus or possibly an elephant. Now, he is the chief ways of God. Now, this is the, one of the largest creatures that we know of today that is a land creature, correct? He is huge. Look at that cedar tree back there. Is that a cedar tree? No. No, that's a poop slinger, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what he does. Because when he goes poo-poo, he swings that tail around and slings the poop away from him, right? 
That's how he likes his fanny. What about the hippo? Look at that cedar tree back there, huh? I actually have a Bible that in the sidelines of the Bible it says that God is referring to either an elephant or a hippopotamus. Well, I don't see that the hippopotamus being the chief ways of God. I don't see that. I don't see him because the hippopotamus mainly stays in the water. That's right. So I think we can pretty well rule him out. And the cedar tree we can rule out. Now, God was also talking to him about hawks. How many of you have seen a hawk? I haven't either. God was also talking to Job about ostriches. Anybody ever seen an ostrich? They don't fly. Right? Yes, they don't fly, but they are a huge, big bird, and their wings just can't support them run. off the ground. And you know, the, when God was talking to him about all those creatures, he talked to him about one named Bohemoth. And now, Bohemoth had the tail of a cedar tree. His he was the chief of the ways of God. You know what that means? That means that he was big. He was huge. Now, if you had a choice, would you say that he is referring to an elephant or maybe a dinosaur? A dinosaur! Sure sounds a lot more like one of these dinosaurs does. But you know what? There are some people who, when they look at the Bible, and you can throw my PowerPoint up there for just a minute, there are some people, when they look at the Bible, they don't look at it like we do. Or they look at the evidence and don't look at it like we do. Go ahead and dim that front set of lights for just a minute. I'm going to go through some of these slides real fast. Go ahead and go to my first slide. We are at an area right now where people are confused. Confusion has taken place a lot because of the Tower of Babel. How many of you remember the story of the Tower of Babel? I'm going to run through it real quick and give you the car wash edition of the Tower of Babel. The ark lands. All of the animals get off the ark along with Noah and his wife and his three children and their wives. Once the ark lands, God tells them to go out and multiply and have children all over the earth. But they don't do it. Instead, they say, no, we're going to stay right here. We're going to build a mighty city right here. And we're going to stay together and we're going to rule this earth together. Isn't that great? They are not going to listen to God. Hmm. Just as soon as God saves them, just a few hundred years later, here's this big tower. And God said, we can't let this happen. He said, we're going to have to stop them from doing this. So God literally came down to earth and confused all of their languages, and people went everywhere. Now that means take a look around this room. Everybody take a look around this room at all the people in this room. Doesn't matter what, how big or tall, short or small that you are, what color you are, we all came from Noah and his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. That's it. We're all related. Every one of us is related. That means everybody in here is cousins to everybody else. Isn't that great? So we're all family. Isn't that something? All because of what happened that day, and God sent everybody away. And we'll talk more about that at another time. Go ahead and go to my next slide. Ever since this confusion has taken place, people have not totally understood where dinosaurs fit into the picture. We already talked to you about Leviathan. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is another one. This is an artist rendition of what they call bunyip. This is an animal that the Aborigines have decided that they have found in Australia. This is a literal drawing of some natives from Australia. This is an animal that they saw. It looks a lot like what? A dinosaur, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, a little bit like a T-Rex, except for a little bit longer arms there. Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. There's some other dinosaurs. This is an actual... This is, this is a skull of this dinosaur that they have actually found. And so then the artist drew a picture of what they thought that that dinosaur might look like. Go ahead and go to the next slide there. Now the Chinese people have talked about dragons for years. They've been talking about them for a very long time. In fact, the Bible mentions dragon many, many, many times. Not just the Chinese people, though. I've got this really awesome book. All right, and if you want a copy of this book, I'll tell you where you can find it. There's a place called Answers in Genesis, all right? In there, they have this book. It's called Dragons, Legends, Lore, and Dinosaurs. And in this book, this is what's really cool, they actually show where people in Babylon, Greece, China, even in America, the United Kingdom and South America in their ancient history have actually talked about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are mentioned all over the world to, through ancient people. Now, the word dinosaur is not the word you find. You find the word dragon. 
How many of you know why you don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Anybody know? Uh, uh, Abby, why do we not find the word dinosaur in the Bible? It wasn't invented until when? Does anybody know what year? 1841. Does anybody know who invented the word dinosaur? Kevin, who invented the word dinosaur? Sir Richard Owen invented the word dinosaur in the year 1841. He found a giant lizard bone and he goes, oh, this is a dinosaur. Now the ancient Greeks had a word for these dragons. They were called dracos. Draco was a giant lizard. The ancient Greeks had a category for the giant lizards called Dracos. Really close to dragon, isn't it? So Sir Richard Owen invented the word dinosaur in 1841. Does anybody know what year our Bible was translated into English? Does anybody know? James. Well, King James did it. Yes, King James. Your King James version of the Bible. Do you know what year that was? I'll give you a hint. It was exactly 400 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. So it takes 2011 and minus 400. Does anybody know? I'll do the math for you really quick. The year 1611. In the year 1611, King, King James translated our Bible over into English for the first time legally. And now you and I have a Bible. That Bible that you have, the King James Version of that Bible, is 400 years old. Now, the earth is how many years old? Does anybody remember? 6,014. Around 6,014 years, according to biblical timelines and our math that we were best able to calculate, right around 6,014 years old. But it didn't come into our language until just 400 years ago. Wow, that's pretty cool though, isn't it? Now we have a Bible and we have that Bible translated in 1611. The word dinosaur hasn't been invented yet. So they would have to use a word that they would have understood at that time, which would have been what? Dragon. dragon. Dragon, that's right. So they would have had to put the word dragon in there in 1611 because we didn't have the word dinosaur. And that's why you don't find the word dinosaur written in the Bible. But we do find creatures like in Job chapter 40 talking about behemoth, and we also hear them in Job chapter 41 talking about Leviathan. Now, if these animals are now dead and extinct, and we no longer have any of these animals around, when did these animals get their names? Well, their animals would have gotten their names sometime after the year 1840, when they found them and they started categorizing these animals. The word Brachiosaurus was not around back in Bible times. So when God was talking about Bohemoth, this would have been the creature that Adam gave the name Bohemoth to. Because Adam, in the garden, named all of the animals. Adam gave all the animals a name. So actually, when we call this a Brachiosaurus, if the Bible is explaining the Brachiosaurus, then we're actually talking about Bohemoth. And that's the name that Adam gave to this creature. Now that is really cool. Knowing that our great 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 grandfather named him Bohemoth. And so we have new names and new words because these items were lost to us. Now, let's pretend for a minute that there were no more giraffes. They were all gone. The giraffes had went extinct. Let's zip forward about 2,000 years into the future. Let's say, now we're in a place that, in time that they call the information age. That means we have computers and we have books and we have all kinds of stuff that is preserving knowledge for years to come. But let's just say we don't have that because back in the Bible times, all they had was handwritten scrolls. Let's just say that this giraffe dies and 2,000 years later, there is nothing. But somebody finds the bone of a long-necked horse. Well, what would they say? Because doesn't a giraffe look a little bit like a long-necked horse? Maybe a little longer legs? He's got legs kind of like a Clydesdale, right? Mm -hmm. And he's got a long neck. If you took that neck down a little bit, shorten those legs, he'd look a whole lot like a horse, wouldn't he? So, you know, 2,000 years from now, if nobody saw this, they would go, that's a long-necked horse. And they'd come up with some kind of long, weird, crazy name for him, and we'd be all like, that's a giraffe, dude. Right? Because... When they die off and you forget about what they are, you call them what you think they are. And that's exactly what has happened to many of our dinosaurs that have died. They probably had other names that we don't know anything about. 
Now, there's a, there is an animal that everybody will go, oh, I know what that is. And I say the word unicorn, right? Unicorn. unicorn. What's a unicorn? An extinct animal. A unicorn is an extinct animal, but it is not a horse with a horn sticking out of its head. It is not a horse with a horn. Now, we see them, we call them a pegasus, or we call them unicorns. They're actually a mythical creature. What I mean by mythical is they're not real. They never existed, all right? Greeks made them up as idols and gods, but they never really existed. But there was an animal named a unicorn. This, the word unicorn literally just means one horn. That's it. Now, this unicorn, the Bible is describing by Job that you could not even be able to tame this animal to ride it. Now, if it was a pegasus or a one-horned horse with wings, I'm sure you could probably tame a horse like that to ride it. But this is talking about a wild beast with one horn that you can't tame. Now again, in 1611, we had to come up with a word that we understood to understand what the word one-horned creature was. Well, the only thing that the Greeks had when they were translating the Bible that they were familiar with was a unicorn, which was a mythological creature. So they take the word unicorn and they slap it in there and say, okay, this must mean unicorn. When really, when we read the word unicorn in the Bible, it's referring to just a one-horned creature. But we are going by what we know and what we've understood, and we take things from our past or from our present and take what we understand and we give them names. And that's why dinosaurs are so tricky for people. Now, how many of you have been in school and they told you at school that dinosaurs died off 65 million years ago? You heard that story? How many of you believe that story? I don't believe it. I don't really buy 65 million years ago. Because the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and he created the earth. And the earth was without form and void. If it doesn't have a form, um, let me just steal somebody out of It's Ian, come here and help me out since you're right up here in the front row. All right. Ian has a form, right? Do you know what form he is? He's in the form of a person. Child. He's in the form of a person. This book has a form. It's in the form of a rectangle. That's right. It's in the form of something. If there is no form, then what is it? It doesn't have a shape. If there's no form, there's no shape. And it says that it is void. If something is void, that means that it is empty. So it doesn't have a shape and it's empty. What is something that has no shape and is empty? A person. No, he's got a shape. He's shaped like a person. What is something that has no shape and is empty? Does anybody know? Reese? There's nothing. It's a trick question. There is nothing that has, a sh has no shape and is empty. And so God said in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. That means it was not there. It didn't exist. And he spoke. This is what's cool. Could you do this? Check this out. God spoke and he said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. good. That's right. He spoke the whole entire world into existence. Thank you for your help, buddy. You can have a seat. So when God spoke, everything listened. And boom, there was light. What's funny is, is God created light before he created the sun. God created the light before there was sun. Do you know what the Bible tells us is going to happen when we get to heaven? It says that the sun and the moon will pass away because there's no need for it because Jesus Christ himself will be the light. Oh, I don't know if you understood what I just said. The sun and the moon and the stars are all going to be gone when we come to heaven because Jesus Christ himself will be the light. Do you know what that means? In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That means that Jesus himself showed up on the scene before God ever even made the world. The Bible says that from the foundations of the world, that the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ, was slain. In other words, before he ever made Adam and Eve and put him in the garden, he already had it worked out with his son. They're going to fall at some point. These people are not going to make it. These people that I have created are going to make a mistake but you're going to give your life for them. And Jesus had already agreed to it 4,000 years before he ever died. He already knew that he was going to die for you. Before Adam and Eve were ever even formed out of the dust of the ground, Jesus already had it planned to give his life for you because he loved you. Jesus already had made that decision. 
So this wasn't something that he just showed up on the scene 4,000 years later going, I guess I better fix this mess. No, Jesus showed up prepared to give his life for you because sin comes at a price. Adam and Eve, when they made the choice to sin, they made that choice of their own free will. They made that choice of their own choosing. Every day we all make mistakes. I want to say something. I hope I don't hurt your feelings, Anna. But me and Anna were talking yesterday. We were watching a, a movie. And I want to show this in this class sometime about a guy named John Bunyan. This guy was in prison for preaching the gospel in the 1500s. They put him in jail for preaching. Good Lord willing, next year we're actually going to teach about some of the people who were martyred for their faith. And what I mean by martyred is they died for their faith because they were killed. John Bunyan was in prison for preaching. And the horrible thing about it was is he was just preaching to people in the town and people were coming and they were wanting to hear. They were hungry to hear the word of God because the Bible had not been translated in English yet. And so not, not legally translated in English. In fact, it was against the law for you to preach in the 1500s. Totally against the law. You could go to jail, be beaten, and killed, possibly. Well, somewhere in the middle of all of this, John Bunyan is there, and he's writing a book. He writes a book called The Pilgrim's Progress. One of the neatest stories that you ever see. And in this story, he's actually talking about how a person loses the weight of sin off of their back. So me and Anna was talking about this story, and we were, we were sharing this while we were watching this cartoon yesterday. And we had a great time watching the cartoon because Anna was learning a lot, and I was learning a lot while we were talking about this. And we literally see the guy, when he gets to the cross, this big heavy load that he has on his back. He kneels down, he asks Jesus to forgive him, and that drops off of his back. Well, from that moment on, this guy was going and he'd meet other people. And other people would say, you know, you shouldn't do this. Don't go this way, the way that the evangelist had told him to go to. They'd say, go this way. It's a shortcut. Or go this way. And the guy would listen. And he would make mistakes. And he'd wind up going somewhere and getting himself in trouble. Remember that? And so Anna asked me a question. And I thought that you all should hear this question today yourself. You see, why? Anna asked me, why did he keep making those mistakes and keep listening to other people when he knew he was supposed to stay on the straight path that the evangelist had told him all about? And I asked her a question in return. And I'm going to ask all of you this question. Is there any time that you ever realized that you did something that you shouldn't have done? Only to find out that you, after you did it, you realized you shouldn't have done it, but at the time it felt like the right thing? Anybody here ever done that? Maybe your mom and dad says, go clean your room, and you're like, I don't want to play. And you go in here and you play and you don't do what you were supposed to do. Or maybe you took something that wasn't yours. Or maybe you said something to your mom and dad that you really wish you hadn't have said. You've done something at some point in your life that you regret. That's what this guy did. And you know why? I'm going to answer your question now, Anna, the best way I can to everybody today. I'm going to tell you why. Because we are capable of making mistakes. We are are sinful people at heart. Doesn't mean we want to be. We really desire to do good. How many of you wish you could never make any mistakes? We want to be that kind of person. We want to be the kind of person who never messes up. We want to be the kind of person who does everything that God wants us to do. And we respect our parents and we respect our teachers and we respect everybody that has authority over us. We really want to. But there's something deep down inside of us that causes us to slide off of that road and make that mistake. But the cool thing was, in this story that John Bunyan was telling, and I, I promise I'll show this sometime in here because it is a great story. In this story, in the Pilgrim's Progress, every time he would make a turn and go down the wrong road and listen to the wrong person, somebody showed up to show him how to get back on the path and make the decision right. And here's where I want to tell you about today. I'm that somebody today. If you have made a decision to turn down the wrong path and you made a mistake, I'm going to be standing there with a flaming sword at the end of your road saying, hey, don't go this way. You go back to the way you know is supposed to be right and you take that straight path. Don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. Keep going the way you're supposed to go. You see, the Bible says, if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, which is Christ Jesus. That word advocate literally means lawyer. Let me explain this. When you mess up, Jesus Christ is your lawyer. God is the judge. And Jesus goes to God and says, Hey, look, you know what? I know Hannah's messed up. But she's mine. And you promised me you would forgive her. 
And he has to forgive her and let her go because of the blood of Jesus. Not only does that count for Hannah, that counts for Lexi, it counts for Ian and Caitlin and Julia and Emma and everybody on this side of the room and everybody on this side of the room and everybody that's not even in church today. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and He'll come into your heart and He'll forgive you of all of your sins. The question is, is why then is it so important if I'm talking about all of that, why is it so important that you understand that dinosaurs lived in the Garden of Eden with people? I'm going to tell you why it's so important. If all of that is so important, then why would I push this so hard? I'm going to tell you why. Because the Word of God is 100% true, and it does not fail. 